This is multivariable calculus, and in this video, I'm going to talk about section 13.4, motion in space. And what we're really talking about here is um, really solving motion problems using our vector functions. So this is where you start to see some of the most common applications of the vector functions that we've been working on in this unit. So the first part of this, it's really simple because these are the same relationships that you've seen um, since if you took AP Calculus AB, you've seen these relationships since then, knowing that the derivative of position is velocity, knowing the derivative of velocity is acceleration. So you can see here, that's essentially what we're looking at here. If I have my uh, vector position function, we'll call it R of T, and I take the derivative of that, I'm going to get the velocity. If I take the derivative of the velocity, I get the acceleration. Magnitude of the uh, velocity is going to give me the speed. Okay, so here are just the common relationships. And again, very, very simple. You can see that we can do this in 2D. We can do it in 3D. We did a lot of this stuff back in Chapter 10 in 2D. And now we're going to get into the same ideas working in three-dimensional space. Now, the thing that I want to point out here is as I go through uh, this section, I didn't choose any problems that were really, really difficult types of questions because I'm just trying to give you the main ideas. And as you work through your assignment on this section, that's where you're going to get into some of the more challenging problems. Okay, so to start with here, we'll just go back to things that we were looking at uh, back when we were dealing with two-dimensional motion. So we have a particle moving along a circular path in, in a way that it's x and y coordinates at time t, our x is 2 cosine t, y is 2 sine t. So they ask us to find the instantaneous velocity and speed at the part of the particle at time t. Okay, so if we want the velocity function, the vector function, all we have to do is remember, just because we're given parametric equations doesn't mean we're not dealing with vectors or a vector function. So what I'm doing with what I'm doing here is I'm essentially saying that my i component is 2 cosine t, my j component is 2 sine t. So I do need to get the derivatives of both of those pieces. So I'm going to get dx dt here. Derivative of 2 cosine t would be negative 2 sine t. And the derivative for the y component here, derivative of 2 sine t would be 2 cosine t. Okay, so from that, I've got my vector function, and I can define it as negative 2 sine t in the i direction and 2 cosine t in the j direction. Okay, and then the next part of this, what's the speed? The speed is just the magnitude of the velocity. So I would have to do the square root of dx dt squared, which would be 4 sine squared t. And then the dy dt squared, I'm going to add to that. That'd be 4 cosine squared t. And if I simplify that out, you can see that I could factor a 4 out, take it out of the square root, and I'd be left with sine squared plus cosine squared inside the radical, which would be 1. So I'm just going to end up with a speed of 2. So you notice that in this particular case, regardless of where I'm moving, I've got a constant speed of 2. Okay, so B, it says... Show that at each instant, the acceleration vector is perpendicular to the velocity vector. So this goes back to some of the stuff that we did back in chapter 12. And we talked about the idea of using dot products to determine the angle between vectors. So that's what I'm going to do here. If we want to show that these vectors are perpendicular, all I'm going to need is to take the dot product of the two vectors. So my acceleration vector, remember, is just the derivative of the velocity vector. So that velocity vector up at the top there, when I take the derivative of the x component, I'm going to get negative 2 cosine t. And when I take the derivative of the y component, I'm going to get negative 2 sine t. Okay, so there's my acceleration vector. Now, if I'm going to get perpendicular um, vectors, I need to check my dot product and make sure that my dot product is equal to 0. So I'm going to take the dot product of the acceleration vector and the velocity vector. And when I do that, I'm going to end up with, let's see, I'll get 4 sine t cosine t. And then for the second piece, I'll have minus 4 sine t cosine t. Okay, 
And remember, I'm just multiplying the corresponding components together. And you can see that is going to combine to make zero. So therefore, I can say that the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity at any time t. Now, remember, I'm showing you this in 2D. You might have this same type of problem in your assignment in 3D. The exact same principles are going to apply. It's just that your calculations get a little bit more complex. But overall, you're still doing the exact same process. All right, so the, last, or the next question here, it says, a particle moves through three space in such a way that its velocity is given by this velocity function, i plus tj plus t squared k. Find the coordinates of the particle at time equals 1, given that the particle is at the point negative 1, 2, 4 at time t equals 0. So as much as this sounds complicated, this goes all the way back to really basic calculus that we did um, back when you first learned antiderivatives and you knew how to get a position function from a velocity function. That's essentially what we're doing here is we're going to find our position function and then using the fact that we know at time is zero, we know where the particle is, then that will allow us to find this position function. Okay, so first of all here, uh, I'm going to take an antiderivative to get my position function. So we're going to call that vector function r of t. Now look at the i component of the velocity. We have 1 times i. So if I do the antiderivative of that component, I would just have t plus some constant. Then I'm going to do the same thing for the j component. The antiderivative of t would be t squared over 2 plus another constant. And I'm just going to differentiate my constants by giving them a different name, c1, c2. And now we'll do the same thing for the z component. I would get t cubed over 3 plus now a third arbitrary constant value. Now, they gave us some information here. We know that the position at time 0 should be, uh, let's see, it should be negative 1, 2, 4. Well, if I plug 0 into my position function that I just found, I would get c1, c2, c3. That's going to have to be equal to this position that we were given up here, negative 1, 2, 4. So you can see now I've already found what c1, c2, and c3 are. So my position vector function then is just going to be um, t minus 1, t squared over 2 plus 2, and t cubed over 3 plus 4. So there's my position at any point in time. And then the last thing they asked us for here, they said find the coordinates of the particle at time t equals 1, um, given that information. So the last thing I need to do here is I just need to rewrite this as my function defined at t equals 1. And you can see plugging t equals 1 into this vector function, I'm going to get 0 in the x direction. I'm going to get 5 halves in the y direction. And I'm going to get 13 thirds in the z direction. Okay, so that would be my position at time 1. Now, one thing that I do want to point out, back up here, when I set this up and I did a c1, c2, c3, you can also write that in a little bit different way. I'm going to write that down here at the bottom. What I could have done is I could have said my position at any point in time is equal to, and then I could have had my components t, t squared over 2, t cubed over 3, and I could have said plus some constant where that constant is going to be represented by just a constant vector, so just some position. So I could have written it that way. I like to write them all out separately because it clarifies in my mind what the process is. But if you want to write it out as um, a shorthand like I did there, that's totally okay too. So just keep that in mind. It's another option. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about here are what we call tangential and normal components of acceleration. Now, when we look at um, acceleration, 
typically we'll have some acceleration vector and we know the acceleration vector is the derivative of the velocity vector. But sometimes we want to know how much of my acceleration is working in a certain direction. So I want to think about how much of my acceleration is working in the direction of the tangent, how much of my acceleration is working in the direction of the normal vector. And so what we can do essentially then is break our acceleration into components. And we have a tangential component, which is obviously meaning we're pointing in the same direction as the tangent. And we have a normal component, which is the component that points in the same direction as the normal vector. So there is some derivation of this in the book. I'm not going to go through all the derivation. But the main thing is, if you notice here, um, we know how to find our unit tangent, right? We take our derivative of our position. We divide by that magnitude. Well, now we're looking at that in terms of velocity. So if I take what I substituted in here, the fact that the unit tangent is equal to the velocity vector divided by its uh, magnitude, what I can do is I can multiply this velocity over and I should have V times uh, our unit tangent is equal to that velocity vector. And then what you can do is you can actually take the derivative of that expression to get the acceleration and that will lead you to how to find the components in the tangential and the normal direction. Okay, so like I said, I didn't go through all the details there, but I gave you, I gave you the main idea. Once we have that, now, keep in mind that when we're looking at these um, tangential components and the normal components, really what they are are just vector projections, right? We're taking a vector and we're saying how much of it is pointing in one direction, how much of it is pointing in another direction if we um, do the projections like we did back in um, chapter 12. So not really that difficult to do, but there's some different ways we can do it. And that's really what the setup goes through in the book. They go through where these things come from. You could just go through and use your vector projections and solve this thing out. But what you would end up doing is essentially what they have here. If I want to have um, the projection of that acceleration vector in the direction of the unit tangent, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do R prime dotted with R double prime divided by the magnitude of R prime. Okay, and then I can do also with the normal um, vector, if I want to go in the direction of the normal vector, you can see they're doing this um, basically in terms of the curvature. So what we can do though is we can do the cross product of R and R prime, find the magnitude of that and divide by the magnitude of R prime. Okay, so uh, like I said, I didn't really go through the details of where all that comes from, but you can read through that in your book. And what I'm going to focus on is the application of that. So down here at the bottom, we've got an example problem. It says a particle moves with this position function. So we have R of T is T squared, T squared, T cubed. And they want us to find the tangential and normal components of the acceleration. Okay, so you can see that in both of these components, I'm going to need to know R prime. I'm going to need to know R double prime. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. So my R prime here is just the derivative of the position. And that would be 2t, 2t, 3t squared. Okay, so pretty simple. And then my R double prime is just the derivative of what I just found. So I'm going to get 2, 2, 6t. And now I just have to go through and do these operations. If I want my... Um, component or the, I guess I should say the component of the acceleration that points in the direction of the tangent, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do R prime dotted with R double prime divided by the magnitude of R prime. So that would be R prime dotted with R double prime divided by the magnitude of R prime. And you can write of t if you want to write that there. I'm just saving a little bit of writing um, using a little bit of shorthand. But I'm not going to go through all the operations here, but you can see how you would do the dot product and combine these things together. And you're going to end up with 8t plus 18t cubed divided by the magnitude of r prime. And that would be the square root of 8t squared plus 9t to the fourth. So at any point in time now, I can figure out what portion of this 
acceleration vector is pointing in the direction of the tangent. So I can sort of do that vector projection now just by using that formula that I've come up with in terms of t. And then we could do the same thing with the normal. So if I want to know the normal um, component, all I have to do now is I have to do r prime, this time crossed with r double prime, take the magnitude of that, because remember that would be a vector resultant there. We take the magnitude of that, and then we're going to divide by the magnitude of r prime. So these are very, very similar in terms of the setup. For the tangential component, we're going to use dot product. For the normal component, we're going to use cross product. Other than that, it's pretty much the same setup. So you know how to do cross products. And again, I'm not going to go through all of those calculations. I'm going to assume that you know how to go through that process. So for your cross product, you would end up with 6t squared, negative 6t squared, 0. So we have to find the magnitude of that. And then the magnitude of r prime, we've already found that in the previous um, part. So that was 8t squared plus 9t to the fourth. And then I've just got to find the magnitude of uh, my cross product. So in the end, this turns out to be 6 root 2 t squared over that same denominator. So that denominator is going to be the square root of 8t squared plus 9t to the fourth. Okay, so pretty simple to do. And again, at any point in time now, I can find my tangential component and I can find my normal component. So not too difficult. Um, it's one of those kind of special case things that we might need to know uh, when we're dealing with things like force vectors. Um, sometimes it can be really, really important to know how much of your force is working in a certain direction. So that would be where we would use something like that. Okay, so um, I've got a couple of examples here that I actually put in because I want you to try them. They're not super difficult, but I want you to give them a shot. So um, this one, it says a force with magnitude 20 newtons acts directly upward from the XY plane on an object with mass 4 kilograms. The object starts at the origin with an initial velocity um, I minus J, find its position function and its speed at time T. So the main thing that you've got to remember here is we're dealing in three dimensions. So I'm just going to give you the setup for this. So don't forget for your force function, we want to be considering that since we have a magnitude 20 newtons acting directly upward, that would be 0, 0, 20. That's our force vector. And remember, force is mass times acceleration. So that's what you're going to use to get this thing set up. So you have to know a little bit of basic physics. Uh, but once you've got that part of it, the rest of it should be fairly straightforward. So pause the video, take a couple of minutes and solve through this. And when you unpause the video, I will show you the solution. Okay, and here's what you should have come up with. You can see there's my force vector 0, 0, 20. My initial position, I'm assuming to be 0. And my initial velocity they gave us is 1 in the i direction, negative 1 in the j direction, and 0 in the k direction. So then using that force uh, function, I was able to find the acceleration. Um, and the acceleration is always going to be 0, 0, 5. So that was just some simple vector math there. So once I know my acceleration, I can take the antiderivative to get the velocity. And that's all I did on this first part here. So I'm just sort of working backwards. And I know the initial velocity. So now I've got my velocity at any time. Okay, so again, this is the same stuff that we did in 2D when we were dealing with parametric equations. It's also the same stuff that we did back when we were dealing with just position in terms of time back in Calculus AB or the first semester of Calculus BC. So fairly simple once you get the first part of this where you've got your acceleration vector. So from there, now I can find my speed at any point in time just by finding the magnitude of that velocity vector. And you can see we get the square root of 2 plus 25t squared. And now the last part of this to get the position, I'm taking the antiderivative of my velocity vector. And so that's where this t plus d1, negative t plus t2 or d2 and 5t squared over 2 plus d3, that's where that came from. Now remember, I could have done t, negative t, 5t squared, that as a vector plus d as a, you know, sort of a vector constant. 
but I, I like to write it out separately like I showed here. So we know the initial position was zero in every um, direction. And then from there, I can solve for the D1, D2, and D3. Obviously, they're all going to be zero. Okay, so not really that difficult to do. And again, you know, you might see problems in your assignment where maybe the antiderivatives are more difficult to work with, but the main idea is always the same. Taking derivatives to get from position to velocity to acceleration, and then taking antiderivatives to go from acceleration to velocity to position. All right, so I've got one more problem here I want you to try. And... Again, sort of a simpler type of problem than what you'll probably see in your assignment because this one is only dealing with motion in two directions. But the overall idea behind it is what I want you to think about because we could take this type of question and we could turn it into a 3D question very, very easily. So what you're given here is a shell being fired from a cannon. They give you the muzzle speed. So that's the speed that it leaves the barrel is 800 feet per second. And we know that the barrel is making an angle of 45 degrees with the horizontal. And the barrel opening is assumed to be at ground level. And again, it's probably off the ground a little bit, but you'll see with the size of the numbers we're dealing with, it's almost negligible in terms of how far off the ground it would be. Okay, so what you need to do to start with here is you need to find some parametric equations that are gonna represent the shell's trajectory. And I'm gonna help you with that part and then I'm gonna have you solve the rest of this question on your own. Okay, so first of all, we know we're dealing with a gravitational constant here of negative 32 feet per second squared. Okay, so when we solve these out, if it's not given, you can assume negative 32 feet per second squared or negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to figure out what would my position be. Well, my position function, I'm going to have to break my velocity into components, first of all. Knowing it's a 45 degree angle, I know I'm just going to multiply by root 2 over 2, or I can use the cosine and the sine. Um, but in addition to that, once I have my velocity components, then I have to take the antiderivative, and from there I can get the position. And it turns out my x equation would be... 400 root 2 t. And then my y equation would be 400 root 2 t. But in this one, we also have to take into account this gravitational constant that would be coming into play. And so if you think about that, that gravitational constant, when I take the antiderivative, I would get negative 32 t. And then when I take the antiderivative again, I would get a negative 16 t squared. So I've got to take that part into account. So those are my position um, equations in terms of what's the position at any point in time. Now remember, you can think of this as vectors, but the main thing is the parametric equations are representing the vector components. So I want you to pause the video, take a few minutes and solve through the rest of the parts of this, and then we'll talk about the solution. Okay, so here's what you should have ended up with. It says, how high does the shell rise? So again, once you've got those two equations, this just turns into the same type of problem we've been doing for several years now. If I want to know how high the shell rises, I need to know when is that vertical component of the velocity going to be zero because I've got to get to that maximum point. So I took my derivative of the y component and set it equal to zero and got 25 root 2 over 2. So I know that's the point where the maximum is going to occur. And the position at that point in time is 5,000 feet. So that's how high the shell rises because we're assuming we're starting at a height of zero. How far does the shell travel horizontally? Well, now that I know where the maximum occurred, and this is a parabolic shape, I can essentially double what I got in part B in terms of time. And I know that this shell is going to hit the ground at time 25 root 2. And from there, what's the x? 25 root 2, that's going to tell me how far it traveled horizontally because we're assuming the initial x position was 0. And then part D, what's the speed of the shell at its point of impact with the ground? So I know how to find my velocity. And at any point, notice the velocity in the x direction is fixed. The velocity in the y direction is going to change. So when I go through and I actually calculate this, I'm going to need to find the velocity at the point in time of 25 root 2. And then from there, find the magnitude of that vector. And it turns out that it's 800 feet per second. 
Okay, so um, like I said, not too difficult, but if you think about this problem and we brought a third dimension into play, then it might get a little bit more complex. And that's where using these main ideas, it's very simple. And since we're dealing with these in components in vector components and using vector equations, if I expand it into three dimensions, it really doesn't make it that much harder because I'm dealing with each component independently. So as long as I can understand what's happening in the X direction, what's happening in the Y direction, and then what's happening in the Z direction, it's sort of like three separate equations that I'm dealing with antiderivatives and finding constants and going through that process. So fairly simple if you can break it down and think of it in that, in that way of dealing with, dealing with it with vectors. Um, so as far as the homework goes, Try to really get your mind wrapped around the idea that with these motion problems, we want to be treating the X, the Y, and the Z separately. And then they become fairly simple once you get through the initial setup of the problem.